Good morning. Here's my cute little clickbait, everyone. My grandson Theo is joining us as we get into God's Word. And uh, today we're going to be continuing in Hebrews 11. So I want to invite you to get your Bibles out and get turning there as we're going to continue to see the examples of faith to help our faith grow today. And we're going to see the children of Israel go across the Red Sea on dry ground, that the Lord is going to do a miracle. And it's really encouraging for our faith to see God's doing miracles. And we see Don is watching. Hi, Don. Hi, Jen. Bless you guys. We'll uh, miss you, but I'm um, glad you're joining us online. So all you out there in the digital world, thank you for uh, continuing to tune in. And if you don't mind, at the end of this, would you share this to anyone you know needs a little boost in their faith this week? And help me get the word out. I really appreciate it. So you little guy say go bye from the digital world. I'm going to go to mom. And uh, off he goes. And we're going to get our Bibles out and turn to Hebrews chapter 11. And today's study is the last one that we're going to get uh, an example of Moses. And it's not Moses directly as you're going to see. In the first, you know, I told you there were five things in, the, in this, what's referred to the hall of faith. Hebrews 11, and it tells us all these marvelous things that different men and women did by their faith in the Lord. And uh, Moses gets five different things basically attributed to him. The first one, however, wasn't really him doing it. It was his parents. It says, who hid him by faith. And you remember that was found in, uh, in verse 23, that they hid him for three months from the command of Pharaoh, because Pharaoh had commanded any Israelite boy that was born was to be thrown into the Nile River and drowned. And so his parents didn't oblige Pharaoh and do what he wanted. And uh, they hid him, kept him alive, till finally mom put him in a basket of reeds and covered it with pitch and floated him in the river. So technically she should say, I put him in the river, but she didn't just chuck him in to drown. She little, made a little basket boat and sent him in there. And then Pharaoh's daughter, of course, found him and adopted him. Then we saw the next thing that Moses did by faith is that when he grew up, he refused to be called the daughter of Pharaoh, uh, uh, the son of Pharaoh's, I said it wrong. Sorry, my brain gets ahead twisted. It's, don't worry. Just, just like I tell my kids, did you hear what I meant? Not what I said, because sometimes I get it inverted. That's just my brain going too fast and I'm, Thinking in Italian and translating to English. I do that sometimes. Sorry about that. But um, but when Moses got older, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And it says instead he chose to endure ill treatment with the people of God rather enjoy, than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin. And then we saw that he also, by faith, left Egypt. And it says that he... He rather in said, not fearing the wrath of the king, but he endured as seeing him who is unseen. We saw last week, the source of all endurance, or two weeks ago, comes from our eyes being fixed on God. You keep your eyes on him and he can give you strength. In Isaiah 40, 31, it says, if you, you those that, that um, wait upon the Lord, that says they will mount up with wings like what? Like eagles, they run and they and they won't grow weary. They'll walk and they'll not faint. So when we put our eyes on him, we really have the true source of endurance that we need to get through this life. And Moses is one of those examples that he gets another thing attributed to him. We saw last week, by faith, he kept the Passover. And this was the first Passover ever that ever happened. They were told to go into the house, slaughter a lamb, put its blood on the doorpost and the lintel of the house and stay inside and roast the lamb and eat it and uh and then uh and, and be prepared in their clothes dressed shoes on their feet staff in their hand ready to march out the door because god was going to deliver them that night and that was the night that he struck down the firstborn all the firstborn in the land of egypt and finally pharaoh said that's enough you can go and he let the people go but today we're going to come to the point where the people of Israel had left Egypt. Pharaoh has let them go. They've gone off into the wilderness across towards the Sinai Peninsula. Moses has taken them across the desert, turned southward, and brought them into a part where the... It goes from flat desert to where there's a mountain range near the 
the Sea of Aqaba, the, the Red Sea, we call it uh, in the Bible, it, uh, on that, the, there's two, two kind of like a Y um, branches of it, and they're on this side of it, which would be, let me see, the sun's sort of the eastern side, they're going up towards uh, Saudi Arabia on one side, today is on one side, and, uh, and Egypt on the other, and they, they were in that portion of land, and they come into a mountainous region. We're going to study more about that from Exodus, because they're going to actually go in and get hemmed in into the land there and uh, right up against the sea with their backs against the sea. And they're going to cry out. They're, they're trapped. We're, we're, we're sitting ducks and Pharaoh's going to send his army. Now, you guys have probably seen this in the movies. He sends his army to go hunt them down. He has a change of heart. You know Pharaoh, always hardening his heart and, uh, and then going against God. Well, today we get to the, pat, the, the, the verse, the last one attributed where Moses is actually just included, because it doesn't say, by faith, Moses did this, like it did last week. It says, by faith, they did this. Look what they did. Verse 29 says, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea, as though they were passing through dry ground. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. So we get the sum up of the whole story. This is a great, I mean, this is not a fable, by the way. This isn't like a fairy tale in the Bible. This is an actual event that happened, and we have evidence of this today. And In fact, today, I, I, I went yesterday and I put some of the videos of the archaeologists that have been researching this in our era. Now, you got to think, this is something that happened in 1450 BC. So, 3,450 years ago, no, 70 years ago, this happened. This is a long time ago. That these guys crossed the Red Sea on dry ground, the Bible says. Now, I've heard all sorts of explanations about this. In fact, in, over in that region, there's five other sites that, um, how do I say this? I, I'm going to just say politely. <laughs> pro profiteers have liked to use this story as, hey, everybody come to our town. We're, a, we're the town where... Um, established on the side of the seashore where Moses, you know, parted the sea. And, and we're up here by the north of the Sea of Aqaba. This is, um, you know, where the called the Sea of Reeds. There's a whole town there that claims we're the spot where he crossed over. But the problem is that the water in the Sea of Reeds is about two feet deep. And so um, they say, well, when the Lord blew the wind, it was kind of like um, a, a, a tide change. You know, the tide went out, the Lord blew the ground dry, and they crossed on dry ground. And then after they did it, the Egyptian army went in after them, and uh, the Lord returned the sea, and the whole Egyptian army was drowned. And I like to tell, point out to people, that takes more faith to believe than I have. Because um, for the Egyptian army to drown in two feet of water in their chariots, I'm sorry, but it just doesn't, it just, uh, I, I can't buy it, you know. And so you have to take all of the details of the story from the author. Now, who wrote the first five books of the Bible, pen them out for us. Moses. Moses. So the details in the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are not like details to Moses that are a long time ago. I heard this in a story from another person, from another person, right? This is from his firsthand experience. He has spent 40 years in the land of Midian, shepherding sheep. By the way, where he's heading back, and taking the children of Israel is actually going back towards Midian. When God says, take my people out of Egypt, the first thing God has him do is take him back. He says, I'm take, you're going to take them because God has an appointment for Moses. God tells Moses, you're going to go back to the mount where I reveal myself. There was a mount where he went up and there was a burning bush. You guys know the story, right? The burning bush that was burning, but the bush didn't get consumed. And the Lord said, the place you're standing on is holy. Take off your sandals. And Moses did. And the Lord gave him instructions and told him he's going to go set the people of, of, of Israel free from the Egyptian bondage. And he's like, how can I do You know the whole story, right? <laughs> but the Lord says, you're going to go back to that place. Now, why is he going to go back to that same mountain? What's going to happen next? The biggie. You guys probably know this. You guys get the Ten Commandments. That's right. So God already knows this. And God's telling Moses, take the people back to that but to get back to Midian the Midian that is spoke of in the scriptures here this is over in Saudi Arabia today and the in Saudi Arabia they actually call the Mount of Sinai 
um, the name in their language is actually the Mount of God meets Moses, or another name for it is the Mount of Moses. Mush, mushi, they say it different than we say Moses in English, but they have a different way they pronounce his name, but it literally translates to the mountain that he met on. So this story is really, really encouraging to my faith because it kind of shows me, if I just step back and I look at the five things attributed that include Moses in the Hall of Faith, I recognize something that I wouldn't have seen if I just studied each story separately. But I'm going to weave just these five together for you this morning for one little point. The first point is, whose faith saved Moses in the beginning? As he was a baby. Was it his faith? No. It was his parents' faith. By faith, they didn't obey Pharaoh. They put him in the river, his mom. You know, by faith, his whole life was spared by the faith of his parents. By the way, some of you that have kids... You think, is it really matter what kind of faith I have or what does it, what, it does, will it have any impact on my children? What's the answer? Absolutely. Your faith will be an example. It might be even the very thing that spares your children's life. But your faith will become an example for them and then your faith will grow or, or uh, toys, kids toys are being passed under my feet, sorry. <laughs> As I speak, <laughs> this is the weird. Somebody slopsided this toy. We had them and they were round and even donuts. But um, here you go. So, sorry, I lost my train of thought ever second. So, the parent's faith is an example to this boy who grows up in Pharaoh's house, and later it becomes his faith of his own doing, to where he even will suffer for his faith rather than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin. And then his faith will be used later to see the whole, the whole nation of Israel delivered from their bondage. By faith, he's going to go back to Egypt and he's going to teach them and tell them we have to keep the Passover that God has spoken for us to do so that death will pass over our house when... That death visits the firstborn of Egypt. That last straw to break the camel's back. Now, there was a lot more things I think he did by faith. You know, like talk about, you know, he's like, I don't know. How will Pharaoh know I'm I'm um, sent by you, God? And God says, what do you got in your hand? Uh, I got a stick. You know, he's a, he's a shepherd, right, for 40 years. He got a little shepherd's staff. He's like, I got this stick. Throw it down. Throws down the staff. What happened to the staff? It became a snake. And he grabs the snake by the tail. And the Lord tells him, and it turns back into his staff. You just take that with you. You're going to use that. Now, this same staff is going to come into today's story, but that staff was used to, to, to throw down in front of Pharaoh and become a snake. And then the Pharaoh's magicians, they threw down their staffs. They became snakes. And as we studied, then Moses' the snake ate their snakes. And then he picked it up and, ta-da, you know, and... But that wasn't enough to make Pharaoh let him go. And then there was all those other plagues that the Lord brought. You know, the, the, the taking take that staff and touch the Nile. And the Nile's water was turned, what? From water to blood. And then the, the, the plagues of the locusts and the flies and the cattle. And all the different plagues that the Lord brought. Until finally the gnats. And all of these plagues, by the way, the magicians of Egypt copied. They didn't take away the plagues. They made it worse. Silly magicians. That's what the devil does, by the way. He can always imitate God in trying to bring judgment and bad things, but he can't bring mercy like God can. He can't lift the judgment. If he would have really, if the magicians would have been truly powerful, every time Moses brought a, a plague, they would have stopped it. But Satan is not more powerful than God. They just tried to imitate. You made frogs? Okay, we'll get more frogs. I'm like, what a stupid thing to do. You already got God bringing frogs all over the place. You'd think they would have said, this is bad enough, but no, they go and get more frogs. To say, we can copy. Sometimes the things that, that, that people in darkness do is just dumb. Flat out, that's the best way I can describe it. So, so Moses now takes the people of Israel. He leads them out across this desert. And um, I put on our, on our uh, website, um, you can go to AmazingGraceKona.com and there's a follow us on Facebook, follow us on YouTube. If you click that YouTube button, it'll take you right to our YouTube channel. And the first row has all our, like, the most 
popular uploads in the next row is the Words of Aloha, our, our sermons that we do. And I included in, the, in that playlist some modern day archeology span of where could this story really have taken place? Because we've had men studying this for, for decades. Where, when, when the, even Solomon knew where this took place. And in Solomon's day, he actually set up granite pillars of red granite, like 16 feet high. Um, they're, they're pretty huge around that these columns and they're, and they're inscribed on the columns in Hebrew. And they say in Hebrew, um, Solomon's name on, on, on it. And they say next to it, Pharaoh's name and Yahweh and death. And they say Mizron, which Mizron was the name for Egypt in their language. And then they say water or Edom, you know, um, water came, brought death. It's kind of a, it's just saying water brought death to Egypt by God. And Solomon is the guy who put this marker here to remember this. The cool thing is that those, those columns were discovered in 1980, um, let's see, no, 1979, I believe, a guy named uh, Ron Wyatt, he discovered one of the columns laying on the side of the seashore of the Red Sea. The waves were lapping over. He's like, what's this? And um, it's kind of really worn from the, you know how when the ocean washes up again, granite's softer than, than some of the, of the sand grinding against it. So it polished it like on one side. And he could only make out a little bit of the writing on it. But later, uh, about four years later, he will discover its twin across the sea, about 13 miles away. Uh, I mean, you know, you have to, like, in a straight line across, in, over in Saudi Arabia today, he finds in 1984, the twin still standing. And the Hebrew is very easy to read on this one because it hasn't been, you know, being pounded by waves. It's just been standing up. And so he finds this. He discovers, he, 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 you know, takes pictures of it and everything. And when he brings out the discovery that, hey, Solomon knew where the children of Israel passed across the Red Sea, he put up these two red granite pillars. And he told on the side in 79, the Israelis were occupying that side of the sea. He told the Israeli government, I found this pillar. Um, and uh, they took it from the seashore, brought it in about 100 feet, put it up, stood it up and put it like on a concrete platform is still there today the the pillar that marks the spot where they crossed over and so people are like i go you know if you study that they, they go did this story really happen do we have any evidence i go well it says still well you guys know the story right the the, the lord puts a pillar of fire in front uh between between the children of israel and the people of god to hold back the egyptians from getting them as he parts the water all night long. Well, let me just read it to you. I'll show you. I'm getting some weird looks. Like people, you don't know this. This is a great. This is a great account that the scripture tells us about this. It says that in in Exodus chapter 14. This is where we're going to look at today, because the faith of Moses doing these Passover thing is going to build up their faith, and by faith we see in Hebrews that now not just the faith of well Moses' parents passes on faith to Moses. Moses passes on faith. <laughs> now to the whole children of Israel as they are going to pass through on dry ground across the Red Sea. We read this in Exodus chapter 14 verse 1 it says now the Lord spoke to Moses saying tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before, before Pi Hirath between Migdal and the sea and you shall camp in front of Baal Zephron opposite by the sea. So the scripture actually tells us where they were to camp and, and this um, Pai Hiroth is in Hebrew, uh, mouth or opening between, um, between two gorges, between two mountains. Like, And over there in their topography, if you go to some of the traditional places where the people want you to come on the north end of the Sea of Aqaba, it doesn't work because it's all flat ground. There's no mouth of gorges. There's no, you know, like opening where the mountains open up and you're stuck in between the sea. But if you go to the place that I'm talking about where the pillar is today, you can, you, and you can check it out on our website just so that you uh, get to see the actual archaeological evidence of this. They, they, um, 
they were there and it says Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel that they are wandering aimlessly in the land in the wilderness has shut them in see the problem was is that they passed between this mountain range and Moses knew God told him where to go and the children of Israel are, are going following him and how many how many uh, men the age of war and up were, were when they did that in numbers chapter one do you remember how many six hundred and three thousand five hundred and fifty men were following Moses the age of war and up now that's not counting the women they didn't count the women nor the children and you know some people don't realize the numbers are astronomical when you think about this story and what God did because it, 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 this is this is remarkable you know, you got you got six hundred thousand. I'm just gonna round up six hundred thousand men, the age of war. Plus, let's say they all have their wives. Just double that is one point two million. That's no children, no animals, nothing. One point two million. But let's say they have, I don't know. We say two point four children per family. That's not even accurate for a, an Israeli, right? The Israeli families were huge. But let's just say they had, I don't know, two kids per family on average, just two. We're now up to like three, three million to three and a half million people following Moses. And the reason I'm telling you these numbers is because some people, they like to downplay it or they saw the movie Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner and they think, well, there's only like a couple hundred extras, you know, that go between the water as the water's parted and they go in and it's just a couple people that are scampering across the thing. And, and you think it's, I go, no, they didn't have enough extras in Hollywood. To do three million, three and a half million people. That's and I'm talking small. I'm I'm just trying to give a conservative number that followed Moses out. But Moses's faith has now affected three million to three and a half, maybe six million people's faith. To where they're about to do something that is. It's got to be. It can't be passing through ground that that's two feet deep in water, and that's a big miracle. It has to be something really, like, enormously big. And the Bible tells us that the wilderness had shut them in. They had passed through. And if you look at the wadi that goes down in that region to this place, there's, a, there's an actual beach. Nueva Beach is um, located on the side of the Sea of, uh, 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 of, of the Gulf of Aqaba there, in the Red Sea. And it's a beach about three miles by five miles. And it's completely, you got to go through a like 75 foot to 100 foot narrowing gap between two steep mountains to get out onto this beach. It's a big beach. And the children of Israel, now I, when I was thinking about this, I was like, oh man, I got to do the math because I hate, I, you know, when people tell stories, I like, well, okay, you got three million, three and a half million people that follow Moses and they're now on a three mile by five mile beach. That's right. Three by five is what, 15 square miles of beach? It's not, um, can you fit that many people? That's my first question. You know, how much space would you have? Would you all be standing like, like little penguins stuck on the beach together, shoulder to shoulder? So I did a little math and I was like, okay, 15 square miles, 4,118,000, no, 418,176,000 square feet. Divided by 3 million people, that's 15,488,000 square feet. Let's see, put that into square yards, divide by nine. And it works out to about 15 square yards per person. So three, uh, 15 yards would be like three yards, nine feet by 15 feet. That's about how much space you have for each of you to stand on the beach. Is that enough space to fit three million people? The answer is yes. They'd fit on the beach. Okay, I, I know it sounds silly, but I like to verify, could you actually fit that many people on that beach? Now remember, they didn't just have the women and the children. They had the oxen, they had the carts, they had the plunder of Egypt that they were bringing in tow. So you gotta leave some room for carts and everything. But it would have been, it would have been tight, I have a feeling, to put them all on the beach. And they are there, and the Bible says they're hemmed in. They're now stuck between two mountains on a beach that's just got a little opening through this mountain pass that leads up to the water and they're stuck there with their backs at the at the sea and the lord says to moses this look at this you guys know the story i'm sure but if you haven't heard this is awesome 
It says, when the king heard that they were stuck there, verse 5, he told that he was told that they had fled to there. Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart towards the people. And they said, what, what is this thing we've done that we let Israel go from serving in us? Oh, no, we lost our servants. Now, when you read this story and you think about how many people, three and a half million people departed and they were all your workforce. Right, they were all your labor. They did all the drawing of the water. They did all the chores. And all of a sudden, you're like, who's going to do the chores now? They had a change of heart. They went and... It, it, it's interesting to me because the Lord actually tells Moses kind of to follow this path down the, into that region and, and kind of almost like do a little, a little circling around wandering, kind of like, so that Pharaoh will hear, hey, they're just kind of stuck they're bottleneck they're stuck they're just kind of wandering camping stuck in this little area and he he has a change of heart we got to go get these people back so verse 6 tells us he made his chariot ready he took his people with him he took 600 select chariots and all the uh, other chariots of egypt with officers over all of them the select char chariots are like the ones that were the fancy royal ones they had like the gold spokes the gold plated spokes pounded over it and he had 600 of those, plus the other chariots. So he's bringing a pretty big army of chariots after these people. And the Lord hardened his heart. It says, And the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, as he chased the sons of Israel, and the sons of Israel are going out boldly, and the Egyptians chased after them, verse 9, with all their horses and their chariots of Pharaoh, and his horsemen and his army. And they overtook them camping by the sea, besides Pit Pit. Hiharoth in front of Baal Zephon. And it says, And Pharaoh drew near, and the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. It says, And they, they became frightened, so the sons of Israel cried to the Lord. Then Moses, they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in this wilderness? Why have you dealt with us this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this, it says, it is this not the word that we spoke to you when we were in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we might serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Now, do they sound happy today? No. no. It would have been better if we just stayed in Egypt and were slaves than it is to be stuck here and going to die. In the, they, they, it, to them, it looks like curtains. We are pinned. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, for he will accomplish for you today something. He says, for the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. And as for you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, and the sons of Israel that the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. As for me, behold, I will harden the heart of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen, and then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord, when I am honored through Pharaoh and through his chariots and his horsemen. And an angel of God who had been going before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. Now, you guys remember, there was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that stretched from the earth up toward the heavens. And it led them through the wilderness. I mean, they had a nightlight out there in the desert. Don't worry. Really big nightlight. It was a column of fire going from the earth to the heavens. And it wasn't any mystery like, when should we move? When, when should we stop? Where when, should we go? When, when, yeah, where should we go? When the pillar moved, okay, guys, pack up camp, we're moving. When the pillar stopped, okay, guys, pitch camp, we're staying for the night. And this pillar accompanying them, leading them through. Now, the pillar's been in front of them, and the pillar swings around and goes behind them. And it's between now the Egyptian army there in that canyon coming in toward them and the children of Israel. And the Lord says, and he puts his angel there too. And it says so that during this night, listen to this. It says, yet it gave light at night. And thus the one who did not come near, it says the other all night long. Thus, I'm sorry, thus the one didn't come near the other all night long. In other words, the Lord's blocking them getting to them all night long. 
Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and, and it says, And the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night, and turned the sea into dry land, so that the waters were divided. And the sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on their left and on their right. It says, And the Egyptians took up the pursuit, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen went in after them into the midst of the sea. It came about in the morning watch that the Lord looked down and the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud and brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. He caused their chariots to swerve, their wheels to swerve. He made it for, difficult for them to drive so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from Israel, for the Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians. And then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea and the water, that the waters may come back over the Egyptians and over their chariots and their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak. So I want you to notice this. He swept the sea back that night, right? And he closed the sea back over them when? The Just going by the biblical account. In the, morning. In the morning, by daybreak. So how many days did it take for them to get across the sea? All night long. It was just a night journey. Get across the sea. The only oh, reason I'm pointing this out is because when I was a young man, being raised in a military, you know, upbringing, a lot of a lot of military men around me, I got used to the idea that there was these guys. I told you about this before. That their whole job in the army is to calculate the movement of troops through a region. Their job is to take into account the the geography, the number of troops, the amount of equipment. All of the supplies that you would need to, like, if you're moving a million army men, or through, in this case, three million, how much water would you need? How much food would you need? How much space would you need for them to camp at night? You know, I mean, three, three, three and a half million people. Where are you gonna, where are you gonna find a campground big enough? It's not like KOA was available back then. You know, this is this is a big campground. And just to give you an idea. Just the average size for that many people to spread out and pitch camp. Like the scripture actually tells us how they were told to camp around the pillar. The Lord told them, you put these guys from this tribe in this spot. You put these guys from this tribe in this one, And you're going to camp in all the, the this pattern that the Lord described all the way around this pillar. Well, if you spread them out enough so that they got... Now, I'm not talking just place to lay down. I'm talking space to eat, prepare your food, go to the bathroom, you know, all that stuff. You, you need, you guys, you need a space for, for camping like we would think of, like, you know, pitching the tent, having a place to sleep, all that stuff. It's going to be about two-thirds the size of the state of Rhode Island. 750 square miles. It's pretty big space. Not like a little teeny little plot of land. And, and that's like, um, that's like 25 miles wide and you know 130 miles long. It's it's like the Big Island. We we need a Big Island just to to just spread them out so we can, you know. I'm just giving you to, to put it in your brain. This is a pretty big deal. Now, do they have that much space over there in that geography in that part of the, of the world? Yes, they sure did. They had enough space, but it's all desert. There's no. I mean, I've seen pictures of that area even today. You can look at one of the YouTube videos I I showed. Of a man who went there just a, just like four years ago, he's brave. I tell you, this man. They they interviewed him. He took his camera and he filmed, and then at, he goes like through nine checkpoints over there just to smuggle out his video. And and the guy would be like, hide your cameras, and then when the you know they pass the checkpoint, he start filming again out the window, just to show. And he tried to retrace the route that the Bible says that these people followed, and he's driving. Through open desert, and you look out at it, it's just flat, open nothingness. You realize, yeah, they had enough room, but how did they get the food? How did they get enough to eat? How did they get enough water? And the Bible tells us that the Lord provided for them the food. He provided the water. And this is one of those things. I, I went ahead and, and made copies for the gang here, but this is a fabulous facts and figures that was put out by the Quartermaster General of the, of the uh, military because his job is to figure out mo troop movements and he wrote about this this story that we're reading about this account it's not a made-up story but he did the math and he said 
One of the biggest arithmetic miracles in the world was Moses and the people of Israel that were in the desert. He said they had to be fed, but feeding three to three and a half million people would require a lot of food. So to put it in perspective, because it's his job to know how do you get that much food, he says, according to the, to, to the, to this quartermaster general, it's reported Moses would have to have 1,500 tons of food each day. So to bring in that much food, let's say on a freight train, to give you an idea, this is how these guys think, how, how many trains, how long, um, he says it would take two freight trains each a mile long just to bring that much food every day. Two freight trains a mile long just for the daily consumption of food. And don't forget they're in the desert and it's dry. I mean, I'm talking, they, they were filming out the window and I'm looking at the video, I'm like, that's, that's like, like serious Arizona Sonoran desert where there's nothing growing, like really bad. They didn't even have cactus in most of it. And I'm just like, it's really, really bad. And, and it said, he says, so they also would need water. And, the, oh, and they also need something maybe to cook the food on. So if you needed like firewood, he says you only need like 4,000 tons of wood to make, you know, fires for, for them to, to have their little fire to, to cook on. So with 4,000 tons of wood, that's a few more freight trains each a mile long. Hey, come here, you. Why are you so fussy when I'm trying to tell them all about Moses and what he did? You just want to be in front of the camera? No. Okay. <laughs> so, so then also to drink. Now, I'm going to point this out. To drink, they would need 11 million gallons of water each day. That's a freight train with tank cars 1,800 miles long. And that's just to have enough water to wash a few dishes, drink, and sponge bath. That's not like being extravagant. This is a, this, when it says that the Lord provided food and he provided water, it is a miracle, right? And you want to see the paper and prove it? So, um, I'll try to, I'll try to put this on for you to, to read the details. But this is, this is, um, something that the quartermaster general wrote that I found the most interesting. When I read this as a young man, I thought, okay, in the movie, the water parts, it heaps up on both sides, like the scripture says, and they pass through on dry ground, and they got these extras running through the, the running through, and it looks like a trap, because I already knew the story, the water's going to close, so I'm like, don't go in, you Egyptians, you're going to drown, you know, that's what I was thinking as a young boy, and they're, they're heading in, and I'm thinking, okay, um, it's not very wide, except the quartermaster general explains that to get everybody across the Red Sea in one night, on a narrow path, double file, the line would be 800 miles long and require 35 days and 35 nights wow. to get through. So it was like a little narrow channel. Like, like some people like to dismiss this miracle and say, well, it was just probably a little teeny gap. And they, they hop skitch, you know, between rock to rock. And I'm like, then that would have taken a month to get through. What, what's so hard for God to make a big enough, now how wide does it need to be? To get across in one night. And this is the part that was really neat. The quartermaster general did the math. He said there would have to be space in, in the Red Sea three miles wide so that they could walk 5,000 men abreast. In other words, shoulder to shoulder. 5,000 people across to be able to cross the sea in one night. I mean, it's his job to move troops. How long does it take to move three and a half million people across the distance of about 13 miles across the Red Sea from dry ground, you know, and and to let you know that the Lord did this miracle, what is really interesting is the man who went there recently, he was following up on archaeological uh, works that were recorded from the days when when this guy Wyatt had gone in the in the 80s and he had he had discovered this spot because he said, look, if this is really the spot, then there's got to be some evidence in the sea, you know, on the ocean floor, because you had the whole Egyptian army drowning down there. Now, granted, it's been 3,500 years since this happened, so the stuff on the bottom of the sea is going to be a little weathered, but, but he went down there with metal detectors, scuba diving, and he started getting hits. And there was like these big round circles of coral, and in the center, he'd get a really strong reading of metal. 
And then he'd go out to the edge and he'd find a, a, at the edges little little pings on the edge of the circle. And he, he stepped back, he realized, wait a minute, all these round circles, because it's all sand over there. All these round circles are wheels of chariot wheels. Some of them were stuck like up into the, from the seafloor, there's one round one on the floor and a, a little stand and then another one at the top, like a, a, an axle that had snapped off and landed on its side. And the coral is all grown on. It doesn't look like an axle with wheels. You need a battle detector to know there's an axle and wheels inside of there. Until he came upon something that I learned about when I was a young man. He came upon a wheel that was only in the center had a, a clump of coral and all the rim and all the spokes were pure gold. He found three of those, by the way. And you can look on our, on our Amazing Grace uh, YouTube channel and you'll see that video. In fact, the, the thumbnail, one of the thumbnails, click on that one that has the picture of the gold rim. That's an actual rim found in the bottom of the Red Sea that, that is there. And I tell you, it builds my faith when you go, oh, so did this really happen? Remember, he had 600 choice chariots. Now, I remember as a young boy learning about this. This is about 1979 when I heard of this discovery um, that they found gold chariot wheels in the bottom of the Red Sea. And I remember the guy that discovered it, Ron White, he was told he can't take it. He, he's not allowed to, what do you call it, when they bring it up from the bottom of the ocean? He's told you have to leave it there. It was like under a big dispute over which country gets to claim the right to the wheel, you know. And, and of course, what's the value of something like that? Can you imagine? He was just gold plating. See, coral doesn't grow on gold. That's why it was such a cool thing. There was three of them that were found, and he, he, there they were. He has pictures of them, video of them, and they, they started arguing the countries on the sides of the sea. It's ours. No, it's ours. It goes in our museum. No, because And they wouldn't let him bring it up. I was like, what? I, I, I would have wanted to just not tell him and take... I mean, that's a terrible say, but, you know, like... Hey man, that's a gold rim from the days. That, how much would that be worth anyway? I mean, as an antiquity in a museum, I think, wow. But just to let you know, for this to actually happen, you need something three miles wide. Now that beach is three miles this way, five miles long. And right out in front of it, you can go to Google Earth Maps and actually see the topography underneath the ocean. And it drops down to about 900 feet, three miles wide, and then on the edges, it, a little wider, it's down to 1,300 feet, and it makes about a 6% grade. They could have walked down and across, and it's all smooth sand, except for the wheels that are there now in the sand, but the, the coral that's grown, but back then they went to bend there. So they got to pass through on dry ground, and the Lord parted. Now, this helps me make sense of it. If the Lord parted the waters and made it wide enough for them to go through. How wide a gap did it have to be? Three miles at least wide. And 5,000 men abreast going across this gap through one night to get across. And Pharaoh comes in with his 600 chariots plus the other chariots and all his horsemen and his army. And they chase in after them. And this is a... This is a 13 mile, well, I'm going from the pillar to the other pillar. It's a little shorter, like just under 13 miles. It's a, it's a pretty big space of land. Three miles wide, 13 miles long. It's a big trap. The water's heaped up on both sides by the Lord, and they get there, and, and the Lord actually holds them back while the children of Israel pass. That pillar of fire is there dancing on the shore. And the cool thing is, check out the video on our YouTube channel because one of the guy who went there six years ago he was there on that beach and he asked the uh, guide hey why is the sand here right at the edge of the seashore why is all this sand um like hard as a rock why is it all like why are all the rocks like fused into the sand he goes i don't know i never noticed this my hotel is up the way and it's not like that up there you know it's like regular sand up there but all the sand on the edge of the sheet, and he actually takes a hammer and chisels and films up close, and the top layer of sand is like, like someone put a furnace to it. Like when you take sand and you, 
and you heat it and it turns to glass and, and the chunks of stuff all melt into it. He snaps it off and breaks it off and there's stones and, and glass all infused. It's really pretty. But the seashore is all melted and he goes, how do you have, how do you explain that? That this whole giant area has melted seashore. And he goes, oh, easy. The Lord put a pillar of fire by night. All night it was getting cooked by the pillar of fire. And it's there to this day. Of course, people don't want you to know about this stuff because then it might like, what, I don't know, substantiate that this is not just a fable or it's not a <laughs> religious story. It's an actual thing that, that happened. I say, yeah. And the cool thing is, it all started because Moses' parents had faith to take care of him when he was little like this. And he grew up and had faith that spread to them. And then they had faith to follow him across the sea in one night. And they get there. And then we read in the scriptures, the coolest part of the story I like anyway. They get across the sea. Turn back to Exodus 14 with me. Would you hold him for just a sec while I grab my Bible? Here, go to Grandma. And, uh, and they go, and <laughs> it says when they, get, when they get across on dry ground, then the Lord caused the waters to, um, to return. And the Egyptians, it says they were fleeing right into it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians into the midst of the sea, verse 27 says. And in verse 28, the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, even Pharaoh, his entire army that had gone into the sea after them. Not even one of them remained. Now, I never could understand that when I was little because I couldn't picture big enough. I wasn't thinking the actual sight, and I didn't understand the scale. A, a, a trap three miles wide, at least, 13 miles long, gives you enough space for all of Pharaoh's army to come into. And they're, and they're dropping down slowly, and it slowly goes back up to like 900 feet depth, and then on the sides, 1,300 feet. So, so even if they were on the edges, still could be done in a chariot. But the Lord says caused confusion to happen to them, and they started having trouble navigating out there. And they knew the Lord was fighting for his people all of a sudden. They're like, let's get out of here. But they couldn't get out because the Lord caused the waters to come back over them and drown them. And it says, And the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, the waters were like a wall to them on their right and on their left. For thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. So some of these guys didn't make it to the seashore. They just weren't alive anymore. Drowned under the water. And Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. And then chapter 15 then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord. I will sing unto the Lord, for he is high and highly exalted. The horse and the rider he has furled into the sea. And the Lord is my strength and my song. He's also become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father God, and I will extol him. And then they go on and sing this whole chapter of the marvelous power. The Lord is our warrior. The Lord is his name. And Pharaoh's chariots and his armies he has cast into the sea. The choicest of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea, and the deep covers them. They went down into the sea like a stone. And thy right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, shatters thine enemies. And the greatness of thine excellence, thou dost overthrow those who rise up against me, thee. Thou dost send forth thy burning anger, and it consumes them as child. And they go on, they keep singing this song until finally Miriam... Moses' sister and the gals, they join in and sing, Sing unto the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and the rider thrown into the sea. That's, by the way, a song over there in Egypt that they still sing today. To remember that the Lord threw these guys, their enemy, into the sea and delivered them. And I think, wow, you know, so what's the big deal? Well, they, they still have this testimony of faith. That was the faith that transmitted from one man to an entire nation that they were able to follow him. Now remember, they're going to come up to the promised land a little later and they're going to send in spies. And the spies are going to come back and they're going to say, the land is really good, but there's giants. We can't do it. And ten, ten of the spies will say, no good. 
but two of them, Joshua and Caleb, are going to say, God can do it. They're going to remember this day. God can do it. This is what we have to remember, by the way. We can't do this. No man could have parted that water that deep, pushed it aside that wide, and made it dry so you could go through. But can our God? This is what it comes down to. Can our God do things bigger than, than, than we understand? And by the way, I want to point this out because the attitude and the, and, the, and the things that the children of Israel speak at this time is really interesting. They, they're like, it was better for us in Egypt being a slave than to, than to come out here. God just wanted to slay us in the wilderness. There wasn't enough graves in Egypt. They had all this wah, wah, wah stuff. What they didn't realize is God was doing the greatest act of deliverance. He was going to set them free from oppression and bondage that they had been in for over 400 years. And sometimes when God is setting us free from bondages and oppression that we've had, maybe think, think of somebody you know that struggled in, in, in an addiction. They, maybe they're, they're addicted to alcohol or drugs. And, and you're saying, well, look, you know, you've got to... We're, you know, we can't let you just keep drinking alcohol. I, I've had friends that had to go completely dry after they've drank, I mean, all the time, a regular heavy drink. They go through these things, um, these, they, call, they detox. They just, I mean, they get the shakes. They feel like, give me a drink, give me a drink. It was better when I was drinking than to go through this. It feels terrible. And they, they kind of say the same stuff that the Egyptians, I mean, the Israelites said about, about their day. And yet, if they just persevere a little bit longer, and they break through that that uh, that that dry out time, and they get detox, all of a sudden it's like, whew, I made it, and things become clear. It's funny how when we're going through the deliverance of something, we think, oh, it's better back in the sin. It's better back in the bondage. It's not. Back in bondage is bondage. And don't... When some people talk about their early days, oh, back in my B.C. days, before Christ, back when I was really sinning and having a great time, they make it like it's a glorious day. You know, it was glorious back then. I did all this sin. I was such a great sinner. I got news for you. The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. You were just a quick digger. As you were digging your grave, you were just burying yourself. You didn't realize it, but you were actually heading towards death. At an accelerated pace. But the free gift of God through Jesus is eternal life. And it's free and it's given to us so you can be freed and not stuck in bondage. And sometimes it's painful when we're going through the deliverance process. Sometimes it's uh, even scary. It even feels like, oh, the enemy is going to get me. He's not going to let me go. But I got news for you. You just need to look at this. This testimony right here to be reminded how big, how great. Look at the song they sang. How great God is. How marvelous. In fact, if you need a little extra credit reading for tonight, go to bed and read Exodus 15, the song that they sang, and focus on how this whole song points out how great God is, how His strength. The Lord is my strength in my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise Him. This is the God who has majestic power in his right hand. This is the God who can shatter his enemies with that power. The greatness of thine excellence, thou dost overthrow those that rise up again. You know, he's great. Sometimes we just need to remember how great he is. Puts it back in perspective, all the stuff we're struggling with. And, and it's hard when we're going through it because we don't focus on how great he is. What do we focus on? How big our problem is. How big our problem is. It's miserable. Look at the army. They're coming. God goes, let me put a pillar between us and them. They can't get through. Now, if you've got a pillar of fire swirling on the beach, and God's going, you ain't coming through. I got news for you. They didn't get to go through. God's like, we're going to stall you here. Now, I, th I didn't get to learn this till yesterday, that somebody four years ago actually went to that beach just following up on the research from the late 70s and early 80s of that guy, Ron Wyatt, and found out that the beach was cooked down underneath where the sand was. And it just happened to be a part of the seashore where, because it's all sandy there. But the sand was washed away on this one little 
part right up against where the water laps back and forth on the beach. And he's like, why is it all hard here? Why is it like a rock? Why is the sand all fused together? He goes, this is a really weird, you know, why are the rocks all fused into the sand and the boulders? And, and the guy, the guide was like, I, I got a hotel just up the road and we, we don't have it like that here. You know, I, I don't know. I've never seen it. And he zoomed in. He put a camera on a tripod and they filmed and chiseled off some of it. And gosh, it was so pretty when you look at it. Check, check it out on the video if you get a chance and just see the, the coolness of, uh, of what, you know, w what it looks like. It's just, it's just amazing. And the, the, uh, it's, it's under the one that says forbidden footage of, of the actual, um, location of the Red Sea crossing on our, on our videos. And at minute 21, 21, okay, 21 minutes, 21 seconds of the video. If you don't want to watch the whole thing, just fast forward to that and you'll see the seashore. And just watch the, the next, you know, 30, 40 seconds. You'll see him chiseling off the beach. And, and see what it does for your faith. Like, we have a lot of sand here in Hawaii, but we don't have fused sand like that, except where the lava has flowed and melted it. They didn't have the lava flowing and melt. I mean, it's not lava flowed over it and melted. This whole thing is baked from the top down. It's really interesting, uh, you know, thing to observe. And I think, oh man, this makes the story just, this account comes to life. I mean, this, those golden wheels are in the bottom of this. Now, I don't know if any of you get any info on where the golden wheels are today. Because in the video, he was forbidden from bringing them up, but that was in the late, uh, like, uh, one of the discoveries was 84, one was 79 when he found it. Um, so, uh, so I would like to know, has, does anyone know where those, have they been exhumed and are they in some museum today where we can go look at them? I think it'd be really great for my faith to, to follow up. So I didn't get time to find anything on them today. If you, if you have the time and you find it, please just message me on our Facebook. Let me know underneath on the video here. And if you don't mind, share this video to somebody else who needs faith this day. Because maybe them hearing about what God did for, for Israel and for Moses and the people will help them realize he's a very big God. And maybe it'll help transmit faith over to them that if he could do that for them, then he can do that for, 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 for their lives and what they're going through. I know it helps my faith to see good examples of faith. So that's why we study his word. That's why we seek him and we see the things that he does. And it, it brings us into a great encouragement, you know, as as he as he delivers people from bondage. Yeah, it can it can seem rough at first, but you know, we sing a song. He didn't bring us out this far to to do what to take, to take us, us back. back again. And you know, sometimes I just need to remember that he was he was bringing them out to to bring them into a promised land, and they were crying. Well, it was better back there. Leek soup was so good. Like, yuck. I'm sorry, I'm not a big onion soup person, you know. But they liked that leek soup back in bondage. I, I, I like stuff in my soup besides just onion, you know. And these guys were, they were complaining. And that's how we are sometimes. Oh, it was so much better back in the days of sin. Oh, the BC days before Christ. It was so much fun. And I'm like, no, it's a lot more fun without the sin being hooked into me. It's a lot more fun with sin just not having its power over me. Having that, that yoke broken by God. That's that's real fun. That's that's the joy that you have when you don't have to sin because God's freed you. And this, by the way, is all of a type. God doing this for Israel was all the things. Now you ask, where did I get this? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul said that all the things that happened to Israel happened then for for whose example? For our example. So these stories, these testimonies of what happened to Israel happened to them so that we could look at them and learn. God delivered them from bondage. God wants to deliver us from bondage. And this type is a type of, that bondage was a type of sin and God wants to deliver you from sin. And he, it, it might seem painful, it might seem scary, but keep your eyes on him. Because he can do great things and this is just to remind you of that this week. So may this bless you. May this encourage your faith. And may you be strengthened in him. And, uh, and you just get to continue on in seeing what he has for you as he leads you forward. So be blessed to the Lord. 
See a squeaky little guy down there? My grandson crawling all around now. He's mobile, guys. It's, my life has changed. It will not be the same. Time to re-baby proof. But uh, blessings to you and aloha from Hawaii. We'll be back next week. The Lord doesn't return. Same bad time, same bad channel. Join us at 1030 Hawaii Standard Time. And we'll continue on in this wonderful Hall of Faith next week as we see the walls of Jericho are going to fall. And that's a whole other story. So we'll get into that next week. Blessings.